But, but looking at commodities, because let's just give the listeners and audience like a sneak peek into your brain looking at com- commodities, because I, I took, uh, took down the uh, 2021 returns in commodities and there's like this enormous spread, right? You have coal and crude oil, like definitely on top uh, with high returns. And then you have silver on the bottom, etc. How do you like in today? Of course, you can change your opinion tomorrow. Let's be aware of that. This is not like... Uh, um, how do you say like uh, the correct answer at every every situation? But what are you looking at now that makes you really intrigued for 2022? Do you have like top five picks at all, or is it too hard to call that in the no, yearly basis? No, it's not too hard to call. No, we can go through that. Um, uh, oil uh, remains a top pick because the look we have a let, let, let me start differently. What happened in the last three weeks, four weeks, uh, changes the commodity landscape in a big way. And that's the war. Russia invaded Ukraine um, and the West sanctioned uh, Russia for it in the most severe possible way. And that will be uh, uh, becoming more, not less, in my view, in, in, in the very short term. So there will be more sanction packages to come. Now, Iran was similarly sanctioned, swift sanction and, and, and other measures. And it lost 30% of GDP overnight. And I think for Russia, this will be a big deal along those lines. Now, why do I mention that in, in, in regards to commodities? Because Russia is a commodity powerhouse. And... Um, so Russia provides, um, you know, produces 10 million of the 10, 100 million oil uh, uh, per day, um, or I should say liquids. Um, but uh, Russia produces 10 million crude oil and, um, and some condensate per day and uh, exports about seven and a half of those. Not in the form of crude, five in the form of crude, but two and a half in the form of products or diesel. Points coming to you all, right? And, um, and that's seven and a half percent of uh, of this market. And I told you before earlier that commodities are pricing at the margin. You know, the last molecule that we have or don't have makes the price. And um, and here we we therefore have a massive uh, dislocation uh, in how commodities work. And on that basis, you can be absolutely sure that commodities, you know, oil needs a long t- needs a first of all. You know, not a peace agreement, it needs a sanction lift. Okay. And that's, the, those are two very different things. So don't expect after in a peace agreement, which I hope in a couple of weeks, I don't know, uh, at some point we'll have a peace agreement. You know, it's not going to change anything for oil because uh, although these, uh, you know, crude oil and gas uh, is technically uh, carved out of the sanction list people are self-sanctioning and in terms of how commodities are handled on a daily basis, it nevertheless has a huge impact. So letter of credits, which is a, you know, a form of financing that you need to ship a barrel from A to B, at the moment they don't clear, right? So if you want to bring in a, a, a barrel of, of Russian crude, uh, uh, the bank and both counterparties need a letter of credit. The, the banks won't, won't clear those letter of credits. Those barrels cannot unload, so you don't touch them. So, so it, it, the reality of the, and that's just one little aspect I mentioned. So, so there is a lot that doesn't work at the moment. Whether the sanction language says you can can import or or crude is excluded or not excluded. So, and that's a big deal. And so we go on. Then um, Russia is, um, you know, twenty percent of nickel, of world nickel production. So that's a big deal there too. Now, the transportation system for nickel is different than is obviously for crude or gas, and we shall come to gas in a moment. Uh, but nevertheless, we'll see whether that nickel easily finds its way to to China. It will, but there will be disruption. There is a period now where the the, the the value chains, the transportation side of a commodity business needs to readjust. And that's not a thing of a day or two. These things take months. And then um, um, uh, 
um, we go to copper, uh, Russia is about four and a half percent of production, more of reserves. So it matters there too. Again, if it would be one percent in each, it would be a big deal. So we go to gas. Um, it's a third of the European market. So the European market, which the Norwegians, I'm sure that you know these numbers inside out, but the, the, the European market is call it a 500 BCM billion cubic meter market. And um, Russia is 150 BCM of that per annum. Either way, without Norway, we would be completely lost. So that let's have that very clear. So I mean, Norway is the lifeline of Europe at the moment. Um, and um, the 150 BCM will be very hard to replace, but that's the process we're in now. Those molecules flow through the pipes that are still on. There were three pipe systems and the fourth one that wanted to be added. So there was the North, North Stream, so German, English word combined, Nord Stream pipeline that transported into Germany from Russia. And then there is a pipe going, uh, the Yamal pipe. And those are the big ones I'm saying now. There are smaller ones that go the Yamal. And then there is, um, call it the Welke, um, uh, you know, line that goes into Austria, so to speak. And these through main um, systems, pipeline systems, um, they still work and they still deliver uh, gas. But what, why is then the gas market so nervous? Because we don't know yeah, at any point in time, they could decide, hey, tomorrow you need to pay in ruble, which he announced two days ago, or hey, by the way, tomorrow we don't want it in ruble, you can also pay in gold. Well, uh, 150 BCM, you know, at, uh, at the moment, the price of, of gas in Europe is what 110 euro per megawatt hour. So 150 BCM is about 1.5 billion megawatt hours. So that you multiply, that's, that equals about 170 billion dollars per year. Balcon, you, how do you gonna pay that in gold? <laughs> I don't know exactly the gold reserve numbers now, but <laughs> it's not gonna be so easy. Um, um, and that every year, <laughs> right? And then you have to transport it, <laughs> right? You're not going to do click. You have to have kind of a rail <laughs> shipping 170 billion uh, uh, gold, but uh, you, uh, you know, that's dollars. And then you convert it into gold pearls and so on. So we could do that calculation quick, but you, you see it's all, it's all getting very rather totally, absurdly complicated, impossible. So, um, but Putin had made the decision, you know, I always tweet like, you know, what European politicians, you know, the Schultz, Mr. Schultz, the Bundeskanzler of Germany, obviously he's very concerned, the Italian uh, uh, Mario Draghi, of course, also. But my point is, you should be concerned because you actually have to get on with it because you don't know when the other side actually makes you force to abandon the Russian oil because they request you to either pay it in a way that you cannot, or he simply goes so ideological, he have to bring back the Soviet Union idea and so on. And so he turns off the gas as well. He hurts himself a lot, obviously, but he thinks he can do it. He obviously thought he can go into Ukraine and do that. And it turns out that's not so easy. So expect it. So we kind of, we, in my view, that's why the market is pricing gas so nervously, right? Nine, uh, 110 um, euro per megawatt hour, that translates for your audience. I think everyone understands barrels a little bit better, but that translates into what, $220 per barrel. 